Good morning, everybody. Good Sunday morning. I'm thankful to my brother uh, for giving me this great privilege and opportunity to sit in his seat uh, on the Sunday morning and to talk to everyone and to learn together, hopefully. Uh, what an incredible privilege. So especially you think about these days of, you know, coming on to the precipice of Rosh Hashanah. We're right at the doorstep. And Rosh Hashanah is an unbelievable time an opportunity. What is Rosh Hashanah? So many people say, oh, it's a new year. Yeah, we don't go out to the bars and get drunk on New Year. Not this new year. So what is this new year? This new year is our opportunity to recognize and come back to our source. That's what we're doing. Rosh Hashanah is coming back to our source. If you look at the entire prayer of Rosh Hashanah, it's vitim lo chata. Hashem, you should be our king again. We should pronounce you as king again. Because during the year, we may have gotten carried away. We got busy with our jobs, with our career, with our uh, you know livelihood. We got carried away with materialism. We got carried away with many different things. This is an opportunity for us to stop everything and say, wow, we lost sight perhaps of Hashem being the king of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. This is the real deal. We're getting into, into the frame of mind of Hashem being in control of everything. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about the process of teshuva, repentance, and how... Teshuvah, repentance in Judaism is very, very unique and very, very different from all other religions, from all other, uh, you know, ways of life. So in Judaism, we don't have any conduits between us and the Almighty. It's direct. It's just like when you call a customer service, you're not particularly excited speaking to somebody from India uh, to try to help you with your problem with your water bill. And I want to talk to somebody who can handle my story right here, who speaks my language and understands what's going on, and I don't have to educate them about the process. Same thing with our, our phones, and you know all of the customer service today is outsourced. So when we talk to the Almighty, we're talking directly to the Almighty. And when we ask for forgiveness, we're asking forgiveness directly. There's no intermediary. There is no conduit through which we communicate with Hashem. We talk directly to Hashem one-on-one. -on -one. And the more we recognize that, and the more we're able to internalize this, that there's no intermediary, it's us directly, the more responsibility we will feel towards communicating directly with Hashem creator of heaven and earth. So when we talk about repentance, repentance is a process. It doesn't just happen in one minute. And the Talmud talks about the process, and we're going to elaborate a little bit on it, hopefully today, about the, the general four steps of teshuva. But before we do that, I want to learn with you a piece of Talmud the Talmud says that Am Rabbi Yochanan, Gedola Tshuva Shemagas Hat Kisei HaKavod. That Tshuva, repentance, is so great that it reaches all the way to the heavenly throne of the Almighty. It is so amazing, it is so powerful, Tshuva, that it reaches the throne of God. So you wonder, how does that happen? So we bring from a verse, the verse says, Shuva Yisrael Ad Hashem Lakecha, Return, O Israel, all the way to Hashem, your God. Say, just teach us that this is what it means. All the way to Hashem, your God, means all the way to Hashem's throne. But now the Midrash says something incredible. The Midrash says that our sages tell us that when Moshe ascended the mountain and went up to the heavens for 40 days, so in each one of the firmaments, he was greeted by a, a group of ministering angels. And those angels were busy reading from the Torah. And then they stopped reading from the Torah and praised a different thing. In the first firmament, they praised the Torah. 
in the second firmament, they read the second day of creation, and then they were praising the Torah and the Jewish people. In the third firmament, it was higher ranking angels, and each one was successively more uh, prominent angels. And they started praising, after reading the third day of creation, they started praising Jerusalem, went up to the fourth firmament. They were reading the fourth day of creation, and then they started praising Mashiach. The fifth, even higher ranking angels, and they were reading the fifth day of creation, and then they were praising Gehenna, purgatory. And then the sixth day of creation was being read on the sixth firmament by even higher ranking angels, and they were praising the Garden of Eden. And then on the highest level, the highest ranking angels, I'm talking the Alfanim, the Seraphim, the Galgalim, the Malachi Rachamim, the Malachi Chesed, all of the highest ranking angels were there. They were reading about the Shabbos. And then when they concluded, they praised Teshuvah, repentance. And this teaches us that repentance goes all the way to the heavenly throne, the highest realms of the heavens. It's an amazing thing. How is it possible that teshuva reaches the highest, the absolute highest level of the heavens? And how is it possible? Even another question is: you, if you look at the at the uh, at the list here, it doesn't make sense that teshuva is the highest. It doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? I have a little guest with me here today, so. So why doesn't it make sense? It doesn't make sense because of the following. Torah, we all know Torah is the most important value in Judaism. The most important, the number one. In fact, one of the only three things created before the world, it says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Oraisa, Yisrael, Oraisa, V'Kut Three things, the Almighty, obviously, the Almighty is was, with, is, and will be. Hashem has no time. So Hashem was here before the world was created. The Jewish people and the Torah. The Torah is the blueprint. So Torah is the blueprint and the blueprint that Hashem used to create the world. Torah is here first. It's the most important thing. And you're telling me that the highest level above that is teshuva, repentance. Our sages tell us that repentance is higher because, you see, what Torah can do, what Torah does, is the Torah provides us with a mechanism, with a tool of clarity. Now, not everybody who learns, you know, there's a famous story in the Talmud, in Avodah Zarah, I think it's attracted track, Avodah Zarah, page 19, it's an amazing story. It's about Rabbi Eliezer ben Durdia. Rabbi Eliezer ben Durdia, Rabbi Eliezer, listen to the name, Rabbi Eliezer ben Durdia. Who is this guy? So he was just a simple Eliezer, a simple guy, simple Jewish guy. And what was he doing? He, he would frequent with, uh, with prostitutes. And the Talmud says that there wasn't a prostitute that he wasn't with. Someone once told him, there's a woman out on the other side of the ocean, very, very, very high cost for her services. And he wasn't with her ever. So he saves up all his money, travels this long distance, and finally makes it to this woman. While they were together, she sneezed, and she says, just like this sneeze cannot return to its source, so to Eliezer, you're such a low life, you can never return to your source. He's in shock. His rabbi never told him that. He's such a low life, he can't return to his source. He left immediately. The Talmud records that he walked, he sat between two mountains, and put his he head between his knees and started crying. And he looks up to the heavens and he says to the heavens, Heavens, please ask God to forgive me. 
And the heavens say, before we ask for you, we have to ask for ourselves. You got to take care of your own business. So he says, earth, can you ask the Almighty to forgive me for my sins? And they said, sorry, we have our own problems we got to ask God for. You're on your own for this. You got to ask God directly yourself. He goes to the mountains and the valleys and he says, please, can you ask God for forgiveness on my behalf? And they said, before we ask for you, we have to ask for ourselves. And he keeps on going through through creation, asking, please, 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 someone ask God to forgive me. And then he said, I see that it only is dependent on my doing, my own doing. And he cried and he cried and he cried. And the Talmud says he died. And a heavenly voice came out and said, Rebbe Eliezer ben Durdia, you are welcome to the world to come. So how do we understand this story? Here's a guy whose entire life was invested in materialistic, self, uh, self-pleasuring experiences. Everything was about me. Everything was about his own self, his own desires. And at the last minute, he, he asks for forgiveness. He cries his eyes out. He dies. And a heavenly voice says, Oh, you're welcome. Rebbe Eliezer ben Durdir, you're welcome to the world to come. One of the great sages heard this, and he cried. He says, Yesh kone olamo b'sha achas, v'yesh kone olamo b'sha os arbe. There are people who acquire their world to come in one instant. And there are people who need many, 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 many experiences, many uh, repentances to attain the, their portion of the world to come. So what we need to understand from this is that Rebbe was a great, great sage, sage of the Jewish people, a leader of thousands of students, taught Torah and learned Torah his whole life. But to have that same clarity that that Eliezer ben Durdia had, that same epiphany of like, oh my goodness, what did I do? That is something that is not is not common. That is something that teshuva, a real, real moment of teshuva, a real moment of recognition, oy vey, I've gone the wrong way. I've done something. I invested in the wrong path. I did something I shouldn't have done. It's like if someone, I, I gave this example on, on Friday in our class, but when I was in, in, in grade school, so I had a, a couple of troublemakers in my class. And those troublemakers were not allowing the teacher to teach. And uh, the principal decided he was going to take care of it. So one day, at the beginning of class, when all the kids were settling down in their seats, the, the principal slipped in to the classroom and to the back of the room. And nobody noticed that he was there. Nobody noticed that the principal was there. So what, what happened? The kids were playing with their spitballs and doing all of their crazy shenanigans. And then the principal had had enough. He's seen enough. He slapped his hand on the back of the wall of the classroom. And suddenly everyone was shocked. They didn't realize they were being watched the entire time. The moment of tshuva is exactly that. Is when we suddenly have this awakening and we realize, oh my goodness, the Almighty was here the entire time and he saw everything that I did, everything that I said, and everything that I thought. Everything was recorded by the Almighty. Oh my goodness. And we start feeling terrible. How could I have done that? How could I have betrayed my relationship with the Almighty? The Almighty gives me and gives me and gives me every single day. And here I neglect my responsibilities. I take advantage of all the gifts that Hashem gives, does for me. And I go against Hashem. I do everything He tells me not to do. I do. It's a tragic thing. When someone realizes that they went down the wrong path, we have a special gift, which is called Teshuvah. 
you can return back to your original state of closeness with the Almighty. Because what is a sin? A sin is something that distances you from God. A mitzvah is something that brings you closer to God. Teshuva eliminates all of the barriers between us and the Almighty. In this week's Torah portion that we just read yesterday, we said, Ki ha mitzvah hazot asher anochi mitzvah This mitzvah that I command you today, lo it's not too far from you. It's something that you can attain. Our sages ask, what mitzvah is this? This mitzvah that I command you today. We have no idea what mitzvah that is. What mitzvah is that? Say, just tell us that's the mitzvah of repentance. It's the mitzvah that it, that's able to fuse us with the Almighty, so to speak, to make a connection with God that we can't do in an ordinary way. We all know that there are... I'm sorry. We all know that there are... I apologize. Thank you. I have my dear friend here. Who's... So um, today's bring your child to work day. So every day is bring your child to work. But yeah. So where was I? Um, so we have the ability to eliminate all of the barriers. We have the ability to remove everything that's in our way. Okay. So we're gonna I lost my train of thought. I apologize. So we'll we'll continue. We'll get back to it, I'm sure. Okay, so Torah has the ability to take us from being a you know, the, the Talmud says a very interesting thing. The Talmud says the, a story. Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, and we all remember the story with Rabbi Akiva when he was 40 years old. He was first learning Torah. 40 years. He was an ignoramus. At 40 years old, he started learning Torah. And his wife believed in him, and she pushed him to go learn Torah, go learn Torah, go learn Torah. Now, what did his father-in-law think about this guy? What did his father-in-law think about this Akiva? So we know that he told his daughter, if you marry this low-life Akiva, he was a very wealthy man, if you marry Akiva, you can't enjoy and derive any pleasure from my possessions. That's what, that's what he told his daughter, Rachel. And she marries Akiva. And Akiva becomes a tremendous Torah scholar. And he goes away for 12 years and he learns in yeshiva, and he comes back home after 12 years. And his wife, he overhears his wife saying to her friend, Oh, if Akiva knew, I would want him to go back for another 12 years to learn. He doesn't go in and say hi and have a cup of coffee. He goes right back to Yeshiva and goes learn for another 12 years. Comes back after 24 years being away from his wife with 24,000 students. 24,000 students. And then his father-in-law made a massive feast for him. And the question is, one second, his father never nullified his vow. He made a promise. He says, if you marry this guy, you can never enjoy for my possessions. You can never enjoy for my possessions. So how is it possible that now he is enjoying from his possessions? The Talmud says, the, the, the Tosafot says, commentary. It's not difficult. The way it is when someone goes to learn Torah is that they become a new person. You're a different person. That means, for us to understand this, if someone is an angry person and they go to law school, they come out of law school after their years of education, did anything change in their anger? No. They're an angry lawyer. If someone goes to medical school and they are a jealous person, so now they're a jealous doctor when they leave. 
nothing changes in your essence, in your character, because you've attained more education. But that's not the case when you go learn Torah. When you go learn Torah, you are transformed and those terrible traits become improved. They don't get eradicated, but they become improved. That's what the Tosafot says. He says, Darkash al Torah, the way of Torah, is it transforms who you are. It's interesting that we, we say that the Torah is mitukim midvash v'nofet sufim. The Torah is sweet like honey. So our sages ask, why is the Torah compared to honey? Compared to sugar. Compared to other sweet things. What are you comparing it to honey? So the halacha says a very interesting thing. It says that regarding honey, that if you put something which is not kosher into honey for an extended period of time, after a certain amount of time, you can take out that non-kosher thing and eat it. Why? Because the honey has such powerful co uh, components to it that it co makes everything that's in it into honey. So you take that non-kosher, that non-kosher, whatever it is that you put into honey, after this extended period of time, it itself becomes honey. Say, so just tell us that's Torah. When someone immerses themselves in Torah, they become Torah. They become honey. And whatever their own character they came in with, they came with that jealousy, they came in with that anger, or whatever else their negative traits were, it's transformed. And you're telling me that all of that, a person goes and learns Torah, someone who does teshuva, like Rabbi Lezer ben Durdia, is even a higher level. Because what Torah does is it transforms you. But teshuva is a rocket ship. It's a rocket ship in our connection, shooting us up to the highest level of connection with Hashem. It breaks all the barriers. It takes everything away. We suddenly were like, so imagine a relationship, a husband and wife. Now anybody who's been married for more than 10 minutes knows that it's not always, you know, a, a love fest. Sometimes there are things that come up that are a little bit challenging in a relationship. And one of the spouse may get upset at the other. There might be a disagreement. There might be some type of discord in the relationship. So what do you do? You work through it. And if you did something wrong, you apologize. And what happens then? What happens if your wife or your husband tells you something and you didn't realize that you didn't, you didn't pay attention? And they're right. They're right. They bring it to your attention. You're like, oh, how could I have done that? How could I have done that? And you feel terrible about it. And it's sincere and it's genuine. You're not saying it just to push it off. Get them off your back. You really feel regret. What happens? Now the relationship gets fused together even stronger. Even stronger. And I have... Any, any doctors here, uh, you know, any doctors, uh, physical therapists. So I had a very interesting story. When I was, uh, it was probably 20, 23 years, 22 years ago, I was playing baseball in Jerusalem. Just before we moved to Houston, we lived in Jerusalem. And on Friday afternoon, I had some extra time. And I went with some friends. We went to a field and we'd play baseball. Now, Israel doesn't know about baseball. So... They don't have like the uh, the dirt, if we you know by the base by the base uh, by the baseline, so it's all grass, and the grass was a little moist, and I was running around second base, and I slipped on the grass field on the wet field, and I fractured my shoulder, and I was in such pain. I was in such pain. I, I walked. I remember I, I I 
we didn't have cell phones like you have today. I didn't have my phone with me, any phone with me, right? So I, I, I held my hand like this, held held my 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 shoulder in together, and I walked to to the emergency room. And I was I was in excruciating pain. Okay, fast forward, I think it was five or six years later, I met with a doctor, and he says to me. I told him that I had once fractured my shoulder. So he said to me, how is, how is your shoulder? Is it stronger than it was previously? I said, actually, yes, I think it's much stronger. He says, you know why? Here's, here's what happens. He says, when there's a break, the body sends more resources to heal it, to heal that break. So now it becomes even stronger so that it shouldn't happen again. And I think that this is the same idea as repentance. When we make a mistake, I'm talking about now between us and our fellow man. We make a mistake and we apologize. So now the relationship becomes even stronger. Even stronger than it was before. It gets glued together. It gets, and the body sends, the, the relationship builds and grows from it. It's an unbelievable thing that when a person makes a mistake and when a person goes down the wrong path and they feel a regret and they apologize for it, it's a very, very big challenge. It's a very big challenge if they don't feel closer. Something is wrong. You have to... It, it the, you're getting fused together now in an even stronger level. With the Almighty, it's the same way. But it's even more. Because the Almighty doesn't just take our repentance and say, okay, now now you're on the you're on my good side. God doesn't say that. You know what God does when there's true repentance? God erases our sins. The sins don't exist anymore. It's not just like, okay, well, let's see how it goes. God eliminates all of the sins are gone. It's as if they never happen. Not only that, our sages tell us, those sins become mitzvahs. Because those sins are a vehicle that brought you closer to God. When you recognized and you had that epiphany and you realized, oy vey, I made a mistake. And now you do teshuva. What happens? Now you become even closer to Hashem. Hashem says, all of those sins now become mitzvahs. Because they were vehicles for you to become closer to Hashem. So the first thing we need to know is that nobody should ever feel me I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70, I'm 80 years old. How is it possible? Hashem doesn't want to hear from me. I've neglected my relationship with God for so many years. He doesn't want to hear from me. Wrong. That's not true. The Almighty wants us close. The Almighty wants our, our closeness. And that's why Hashem keeps us in this world because He says, I know my child's going to come back. Today's the day He's going to come back. Today's the day that she's going to say she realizes she made a mistake. Hashem doesn't. You know, it's an amazing perspective. If your child came over to you and said, Daddy, Mommy, give me 10 bucks. Michael, like, uh, excuse me? You say, please. Mom, please, Dad, can I have $10? I need for, you know, the canteen. I need it for snacks. I need it for, yeah, you ask nicely, please. And they give you the money, you say, th you uh, thank you so much. And they'll say, you're welcome. You don't just demand things. Imagine that your child says, give me 10 bucks, mom. And you say, excuse me, you don't talk to me like that. They said, really? They give you a slap across the face. Imagine such a thing. Would you give them $10? I don't think there's a person on planet Earth that would say, oh, yes, sure, my sweetheart. Here's your $10. I'm sorry it took so long. I'm sorry I didn't have it ready before. N nobody. 
Are you crazy? But yet, how do we behave with the Almighty? Hashem tells us what we should do in His Torah. Perhaps we don't follow it properly. And we say, Hashem, give me. And then when we don't, we continue to rebel against the Almighty. We continue to trample on His mitzvahs, on His commandments. We continue to trample on the ways Hashem wants us to live. And we're still demanding, give me, give me, give me. We look at our prayers, give me, everything is give me. We're slapping God in the face. And we're opening our hands saying, give it to me. And God doesn't turn off the oxygen. He doesn't say that's not the way you talk to your father. There's going to be repercussions for this. That's not the way God treats us. God every day with loving kindness, with beauty, with splendor, God gives and gives and gives and gives. Because God loves us so much more than a parent loves a child even. God believes in us because he's our creator and he knows what we're capable of. He knows that we're capable of recognizing that we've gone down the wrong path. He knows that one day we're going to come back and we're going to be that Eliezer ben Durdia, who then was titled Rebbe Eliezer ben Durdia because he taught us how low you can be and how high you can go with one moment of clarity. It just the Mishnah tells us that anybody you learn something from, you have to call them Rebbe. We learn about repentance from Rebbe Eliezer ben Durdia because he taught the world what it means to repent. He taught the world that it doesn't make a difference how old you are. It doesn't make a difference how far you are. It doesn't make a difference how distant you are. Hashem always wants us near. Hashem is waiting for us. He wants us close. This is the greatest, the greatest level that anyone can ever attain on this world is the level of repentance, of true, earnest repentance. Because there's nothing higher than that. It's when you have that absolute closeness with Hashem where there's no barriers. When someone really feels remorse, what do you do? You, you, you pour out your heart. You cry. You say, please, I didn't realize. It was a mistake. I would never have done that. I, would ne I don't want to hurt you. When you feel that remorse, that's when you feel that closeness. And this is the gift of Teshuvah. So the, there's four things that we need to talk about when we talk about Teshuvah. Number one, you can't continue doing the same sin and asking for forgiveness. It's like, imagine I go over to somebody I give him a punch. I say, I'm so sorry I punched you. And I give him another one. I'm so sorry that I did that earlier. It really, I shouldn't do that. I give him another punch, right? <laughs> you don't ask forgiveness for something you're continuing to do. So our sages tell us that the four-step process is, number one, you have to leave the sin. Number two, you have to have remorse. Charata. You have to also, you have to have re regret. You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to leave the sin. And then you have to accept for the future. You can't, you can't skip any of these steps. Because you can't sit at home and say, I have terrible remorse, but I'm not going to ask you forgiveness for the thing I may have done to you. There has to be a request. 
I'm sorry. I did this wrong. And you have to be able to, to uh, define what it is that you feel remorse for. Not just say, well, I'm sure they understand that I feel bad. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. You do something that hurts your fellow man, by the way, you can't ask God for forgiveness for that. You have to ask the person for forgiveness for that. When you do something to somebody, you can't say, Hashem, can you please forgive me for what I've done to my neighbor? No, that's, that's not the way it works. Hashem says, what you did wrong to your fellow man, you have to talk to your fellow man and seek forgiveness from them. What you do wrong to the Almighty, that you ask the Almighty. She has a pacifier here on the floor. She has a pacifier. I'm sorry. So, the, the what the Almighty is wanting from us is that we should go and communicate with one another. We did something wrong. It could be to a child. It could be to a spouse. It could be to a parent. It could be to a neighbor and a friend. Call them up. This is the time before Rosh Hashanah. It's the season of repentance. It's in the year. The Almighty wants us close. But we can't be close to God if we have barriers among our fellow, our fellow men. If there is a problem between us and our fellow mankind, there's no way we can come to the Almighty and ask Him forgiveness. So, when, when seeking that forgiveness from our fellow man, well, I apologize. They, they didn't want to respond to me. Well, it's, it might take time. It doesn't happen in, in a moment. It doesn't take a minute for someone to get over their hurt feelings. Sometimes it takes much more than that. And that's our responsibility. We have to go and seek out their forgiveness. That's that's our responsibility. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about each one of these steps. Number one is that you have to have regret. If you really don't feel bad that you actually did something wrong, then what are you doing? What are you saying I'm sorry for if it's not even genuine? If you have regret, if you have remorse, then it's a step. It's part of the process. But if you don't even feel bad for what you did, sometimes children, like, they don't necessarily feel bad that they did something wrong. They don't. They, they have certain selfish motives. They have other things that are in their way. And that inhibits them from feeling remorse. Our selfishness sometimes gets in the way. And this is something we need to recognize and keep it in check. Because if we don't feel remorse, we cannot attain forgiveness. Azivat achet, leaving the sin. Our sage has given an example. They say it's like someone going into the ritual bath. And what does a ritual bath do? It removes the unholiness, the impurity. Now, if someone touches the carcass of a non-kosher animal, even a kosher animal, right? But if someone touches the carcass of a non-kosher animal, it defiles them spiritually. And they need to go into a ritual bath to cleanse them of that. So imagine someone goes into the ritual bath, bath with a dead with a dead mouse in their hand the thing that makes them impure continue continues to make them impure but i'm in the ritual bath but you're holding it in your hand you have to let go of it that means it could cleanse you it could cleanse you but you're not letting it cleanse you because you're still holding on to it you're still holding on to it let go of it you know you know how they catch monkeys they put the food that they like the peanuts or whatever it is they put it into a hole that's bigger than their closed fist 
So what they do is they, they make their fist really narrow. They put their hand in. They grab their peanut. And then they try to pull it out. They can't get it out. And that's how they catch them. Our sages tell us that that's us. We hold on to our sins and we're not ready to let go. You got to let go. Oh, now you can get out. Now you can remove yourself from that mistake, from that error that you went down the wrong path. But if you hold on to that sin, you can't you can't get get away from it. A person has to accept for the future. A person must accept for the future. And to be deliberate in declaring, I made this mistake in the past. I'm going to put every effort forward not to do it again in the future. Because that shows sincerity. That I, I declare it with my mouth, with my words. I'm taking an actual step to distance myself from this. It's not enough to just say, yeah, I made mistakes. We all make mistakes, don't we? But I'm going to take it one step forward. I'm going to accept to never do it again in the future. But how can I make such an acceptance? How can I accept upon myself to never do it again if I don't know what the future is going to bring? And many people are blocked by this. They're like, well, I can't say that I'm ever going to do it again. I don't know if I'm going to ever do it again. So this is something that our sages teach us. When you accept that in the future you won't do anything, and you accept it upon yourself with words, you'll have special assistance from heaven to avoid falling into that trap again. So imagine if you said something disparaging against the Almighty. You said something disparaging against the Almighty. And now, how can I ever say to the Almighty that I'm never going to do that again? You know what, Hashem, I accept upon myself that I will never say something derogatory, something that is not flattering to the Almighty. You know that it's it's an interesting thing. You're not, the Jewish people had to repent for speaking Lashon Hara, speaking slander about who? Not about a, a person, about the land of Israel. You spoke Lashon Hara about the land of Israel. You're not allowed to speak negatively about the land of Israel. That includes, by the way, talking about, oh, Israeli bureaucracy, it's insane. You're talking bad about the land of Israel, be careful. Got to be careful. The Jewish people had to pay a heavy price for that. We have a Tisha B'Av, a ninth of Av, because of that negative tale that was spoken about what? About the land of Israel. Hashem's creation. The greatest land on earth. You speak negatively about that. So what do you have to do? You have to say, you know what? God, forgive me. I will, God willing, with your help, never speak badly about your land again. Because once you make a verbal commitment to something, it's a whole different story. So if a person is really sincere about teshuva, it's a whole process of teshuva. It's a whole transformative experience where I'm not the same person I was previously because now I accepted new things into my... It's like a company does a review and they look at what are the profits, what are the losses, what are the good parts of the company, what are the bad parts of the, of, of the company, where are we doing well, where are we not doing well, and what do they do? They say, okay, we're charting a new course for the new year. We're going to accept change for the future. Change certain policies. The things that were good, we're going to continue to do good. But the things that are not good, we're going to approve. It's called teshuva. It's called teshuva. That's repentance, but in a different form of repentance. I want to tell you that last year, after giving one of my own classes on repentance, I realized that there were two specific people 
that I, I said strong words to them throughout the year. Not throughout the year, but during that year. And I needed to apologize appropriately. So, and both of them don't live in Houston. Both of them are prominent rabbis in other cities. And we had a disagreement of certain communal matters, and I, I was uh, very forceful. So I called them each up. And I said, you know something? It's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur time. And I'm evaluating what I've done this year. And I think the way I spoke to you was perhaps inappropriate. And I want to ask forgiveness. And it was amazing. It takes a lot. I'll tell you what, it, it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't easy. It takes a, it takes a lot of humility to, to do that. And I'm not such a humble person. So I had to say, you know what? I made a mistake. I won't do it again. I'm sorry. It ended up, in be, instead of being an awkward two-minute conversation, it ended up being with each of them a, a almost an identical experience. It was almost an hour-long conversation that was so much joy, so much love, so much friendship that came from it. And since, by the way, with each of those individuals, our relationship has flourished. Because sometimes we need to just take a step back and realize I'm human. I have flaws. I make mistakes. I do things that sometimes aren't exactly 100% with everyone else around me. I think, I don't know that there's anybody on planet Earth who wants to do evil. Everybody's thinking about themselves a little bit too much. And if a person is able to remove themselves from their own little bubble, from their own little mistakes, then what happens is they're able to they're able to clear it all. So I, I'm sorry I have to do this, but I, I'm going to have to uh, end class a little early today uh, due to my my uh, my little uh, precious gem here. Uh, but I, I want to just leave, leave off with one blessing. And the blessing is as follows: Hashem loves us. Hashem wants us close. We should all merit to attain that closeness with Hashem. To have that friendship and that closeness with Hashem exactly the way Hashem wants it. You know, what does it say about the Jewish people? God took us out of Egypt. You took out your friends. Who's your friends? Who's Hashem referring to as friends? Each and every one of us. He took us out of Egypt because he loves us. We're his buddies. Hashem doesn't need our love. Hashem wants and desires our love. We should all merit to have clarity and to introspect and to look at our year and to say to ourselves, what do I need to change? What? Maybe, maybe that sister-in-law that I don't talk to, maybe I need to open up to her and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Maybe I wasn't so kind. Maybe I wasn't so friendly. Maybe I wasn't so welcoming. And I'm telling you, the rewards that come from true repentance are unbelievable. Unbelievable. Had someone who told me, says, you know, I don't speak to one of my children. I haven't spoke to them in 10 years. So why don't you pick up a phone and call? Me? I should call them. They should call me. That's teshuva. Teshuva is when you say it's not about them, it's about me. I have something that's not whole in my life. I need to take the initiative. Hashem should bless us all, that we should have the ability, the power, the strength, the courage to do the right thing and to look internally, to look into ourselves to find the way to improve the relationships around us, the relationship with Hashem, and God willing, God will accept with love our repentance. Amen.